a beautiful family with six adopted children and two mothers in a loving relationship. A Facebook and an Instagram account filled with idyllic photos of their children learning, traveling, and smiling together in matching outfits. Meet the Hart family, a family who seemed to be filled with love and laughter until they shock the world with an unthinkable case of familicide. It was 3.38 p.m. on Monday, March 26, 2018, when a 911 call came in from Juan Creek Crossing on California Scenic Highway 1. German tourists were enjoying the iconic view when something jarring caught their eye. A gold GMC Yukon XL was upside down in the Pacific Ocean at the bottom of the rocky cliff. When authorities arrived on the scene, they found the body of Jennifer Hart at the wheel of the SUV. The body of her partner, Sarah Hart, was pinned between the roof and the back seats. The bodies of three children, 19-year-old Marcus, 14-year-old Jeremiah, and 14-year-old Abigail, were also found at the crash scene along with Jennifer and Sarah. It was on that afternoon that two searches began. The first search was for the other three children. It was assumed that they were in the car and had been swept out to sea, but no one could say for certain until their bodies were found. The second search was for answers. Everyone who knew the Hart family wanted to understand how a family who looked so happy in photos online and appeared so very normal at music festivals with their friends could end up driving straight off a 100-foot cliff into the ocean. At first, the Hart family's friends and online followers defended the family, saying this surely must have been an accident. There had to be some explanation. Crash analysts were quick to point out that there were no skid marks at the scene. The SUV hadn't braked at all before plunging over the cliff. The speedometer was stuck at 90 miles per hour in the wrecked vehicle. Soon enough, dark details about the family began to emerge. When all the puzzle pieces were finally put together, they revealed a disturbing saga of abuse and neglect. The Hearts had removed their children from public school and moved from place to place in an effort to evade child protective services in multiple states. How could Jennifer and Sarah have hidden the painful truth about their home life from public view? How did they fool so many people into believing they were the perfect family? And most importantly, how did Child Protective Services fail to help these six children? The answers to these questions came together pretty quickly once everyone started talking to one another about the small details they noticed over the years. Jin and Sarah first became licensed foster parents in 2005. They had one 15-year-old foster daughter. Jin and Sarah told the teenage girl she could live with them and be the older sister to their soon-to-be adopted children. Friends have said that the couple frequently complained about their foster daughter, claiming she did things like eat out of the trash. The foster daughter, now an adult, has stated their claims were untrue. Once the first three adoptive siblings arrived at the Hart home in March 2006, Jin and Sarah decided to abandon their foster daughter without any warning. They dropped her off at a therapist appointment and never returned for her, leaving her to be placed in another foster home. The adoptive children who first arrived in their home were Marcus, Hannah, and Abigail. They were ages 7, 4, and 2 and came from Texas to the Hart home in Minnesota. It wasn't until 2008 that the first hints of possible abuse and neglect started to filter in to authorities. Several complaints were made to CPS by the children's school. Hannah and Abigail were both seen eating out of trash cans at their school. They had also complained of bruises on their abdomens. The children told their teachers that Jen hit them with a belt. An investigation was open, but nothing ever came of it. Jen and Sarah told social workers that the children had gotten the bruises accidentally and that they were eating from the trash due to food insecurity issues left over from prior trauma before being adopted. The staff at the school didn't believe these excuses, but they soon stopped reporting things to the authorities in fear that the children would be further punished at home. This was the first time that the children slipped through the cracks. The abuse continued. Sarah and Jen withdrew the three children from school and began homeschooling them for a short time, until the adoption agency required them to have the children in public school in order to finalize the adoptions of the next sibling set to enter the Hart home, Devante, Jeremiah, and Sierra. 
In September 2010, the school again reported Jen and Sarah for abuse. Abigail had bruises all over her stomach, back, and buttocks. She told her teachers that Jen spanked her with a closed fist because she had a penny in her pocket that Jen thought she had stolen. When CPS interviewed the children, Abigail said that being grounded meant you had to stay in bed all day and miss lunchtime. Abigail was six years old at the time and only appeared to be the size of a young toddler. During a mandated doctor visit, the doctor noted her size, but Jen and Sarah explained that Abigail was just naturally small, saying they didn't know her family's medical history. Despite Abigail blaming Jen for the abuse, Sarah claimed that she was the one who had spanked the little girl, stating she bent Abigail over the bathtub and spanked her repeatedly until it had gotten out of control. Charges were filed in court against Sarah for domestic assault and malicious punishment of a child. During the death investigation, a former friend of Jen's brought an email from 2010 to light. Jen told the friend that Sarah had said some hurtful things. Jen went on to say, For quite some time, I have felt very underappreciated and taken for granted in our relationship, and at times, unloved, she wrote. While I know deep in my heart how much she loves me, she is just horrible about showing it. I have felt that I have been raising the kids on my own, she added. I need a break. What was actually happening in their household? Every couple experiences relationship troubles, but in hindsight, perhaps there was something more serious going on. Parenting children with backgrounds of trauma like the six kids the Hearts adopted is no easy task. The behavior issues can be exhausting and draining to manage on a daily basis. Pressure between the two women was beginning to build. In April 2011, Sarah pled guilty to domestic assault. She was given a suspended jail sentence, probation, a $300 fine, and ordered to take a skill-building class by CPS with the goal of ending physical discipline in the home. It seems as if the children were no longer slipping through the cracks with authorities, but in actuality, things were still amiss in the Hart family home. Despite the abuse on record, the Hearts were still able to finalize the adoption of the second sibling set. Devante, Jeremiah, and Sierra were now permanent members of the Hart family. Jen and Sarah quickly withdrew all six children from public school. They never attended public school again. As soon as Sarah completed the terms of her probation, she moved from Minnesota to Westland, Oregon, and took a job working at Cole's clothing store. A few months later, Jen followed with their six children. While Sarah was away, a family friend named Alexandra Argyropoulos spent two weeks helping Jen with the children. Initially, she thought Jennifer Hart was a loving mother. However, after spending time in their home, she became concerned. Alexandra stated to Child Protective Services that love and compassion for the children was largely absent and that they were frequently and harshly punished for common childlike and adolescent behaviors such as laughing too loudly. The offending child wouldn't be allowed to speak for an entire day or be forced to stare at the wall for an extended period of time. She also said Jen often withheld meals and the children appeared constantly hungry. By this point, alarm bells should have been ringing for authorities. Something was clearly very, very wrong at home. Caseworkers interviewed the children separately. The kids gave the workers nearly identical answers that were obviously pre-rehearsed. Child Protective Services ordered the children to see a doctor who noted their heights and weights were so low that they weren't even on the growth charts for the children's ages. Since the children appeared to have no other health concerns aside from being small, the case was closed. During the following years, the family traveled around and attended multiple music festivals where they met many new friends who adored the unique family and loved Jen's idyllic and inspirational Facebook posts. Family and friends who criticized Jen's parenting were estranged by the couple, with Sarah following along behind Jen. The family also participated in social justice protests. 
In 2014, a photo of Devante hugging a police officer went viral, bringing a lot of attention to the Hart family. This led to another move, this time over the state line into Washington, where the final cracks formed in the family breakdown. The Hearts moved in next door to a retired couple named Dana and Bruce DeKalb in 2017. Everything was quiet from the Hearts' home next door until one night at 1.30 in the morning. Their doorbell rang and Bruce answered it. Hannah was at the door. She had twigs in her hair and her front teeth were missing. Hide me, she pleaded. They whip us with a belt. She ran into the DeKalb's home, up the stairs, and hid in the bedroom where Dana was sleeping. You gotta help. Please protect me. Don't make me go back, she said, waking Dana. They're racist and they abuse us. Jen came over a few minutes later and forced Hannah to return home. The next morning, the DeKalb's doorbell rang again at the ungodly hour of 6.30 a.m. It was the Hart family. Hannah brought the DeKalb's a handwritten apology letter, making excuses for her behavior the night before. Soon, Devante began sneaking over to the DeKalb's home and begging them for food whenever his parents weren't paying attention. Dana and Bruce were worried, but also afraid to cause drama by reporting their neighbors to Child Protective Services. When Devante pleaded with Dana not to tell his mother, she asked him which mother he meant. He explained that there was mom and Sarah and that mom was responsible for the abuse. Sarah didn't used to go along with it, Devante told Miss DeKalb, but was now tolerating Jennifer's behavior. About a week ago or so, um, one of the children came over and started uh, asking for food. And it went on for a period of time until we kind of determined that he was probably reaching out and we determined to, that we should call the Child Protective Services, and that's what we did on Friday. Dana's father listened to his daughter's concerns and decided to call CPS himself. Investigators showed up at the family's home, and what happened next has been mostly speculation. It seems that the family decided to go on the run again. 54 hours after leaving their home next door to the DeKalbs, Jennifer Hart drove their SUV over a 100-foot cliff onto the rocky shore of the Pacific Ocean. The children had fallen through the cracks of Child Protective Services for the last time. The bodies of two of the three missing children later washed ashore. Devante was never found but is assumed to have washed out to sea. A Google search from the day before the incident found on Sarah Hart's phone said, is death by drowning relatively painless? Toxicology reports showed that Jennifer was drunk at the time of the crash. Sarah and the two of the children had overdosed on Benadryl in the car. While some of our questions are answered, the biggest question of all still remains. How did six children cry out for help for more than a decade without being rescued? How did our system fail the heart children so completely? And most importantly, what changes can we make to prevent a similar tragedy from happening in the future?